you know, we got to look at the positive side. What can we do? I know there's lazy, drunk sinners out there, and we say, well, they just want to be in this situation. You know, if we look at it that way, we, we, we lose compassion for people. We see a person on the street, and we say, well, he put himself there. You don't know that. You don't know that. And besides, when you started sinning, whose fault was that? I could say the same. You put yourself there. Why would I go give you the gospel? You wanted to go do this kind of stuff. Jesus didn't think that way. He didn't think that way. All right. Good morning. So just to add to the announcements, why well, I didn't uh, talk to Pete about it, because uh, it's a lot to pass over, but you probably noticed uh, the boxes when you came in. Uh, my sisters uh, had this ministry that asked us to see if our church was interested. I said, you know what, I will announce it. And there's boxes there, and you can do it. So where this is going is uh, to the poorest parts of Ukraine. They're shipping these little boxes. You probably have heard of this kind of stuff before. There's a couple different mission groups that have done this before. Uh, some of them, there has been some scammery and stuff going on. So some people are iffy about those. From what I hear... From what the little research I've done, I haven't done much, so you can do your own. Don't just trust what I say. But uh, there's no money going in the box, so I trust a little bit more. Who's going to steal a scarf, a toque, uh, you know, those kind of things. But there was, uh, for a while, it seemed like uh, some ministry going around, the money would go in the box, and it would go missing, and it seemed to be this business for somebody that they were running. So, yeah, sending stuff over there, but somebody over here is getting rich. So, I mean, and, you know, like that, there's many people that taint the ministry that way or abuse it and use it in a way to maybe to gain gain money or uh, whatever it is, fame. But you know what? Let's not throw ministry out just because there's corruption out there. Let's not stop preaching the gospel just because Mormons walk around and kind of embarrass, get, make it embarrassing to go talk to somebody gospel like, oh, you're a Mormon, you're Jehovah, because those are the only people that do it. It shouldn't be like that. You know, I, I look at it and say, they stole that from the Christians. You know, the Christians went around preaching, reaching people, and all of a sudden the Mormons, hey, let's go do that too. Let's go get our, you know, group bigger. Let's go Jehovah Witness. And now they're the ones known for it. They're the ones known for going around and, let's say, evangelizing their false doctrine. And, uh, but I, I don't think the church should get, well, we're not going to do that because those people do that. We're not going to do that because that's scam. We're not going to preach because there's so many false preachers. You can't think that way. So I want to encourage you, th this church... I really want to see us go more into missions. I want to get more mission-minded, and I think uh, I would like you guys to join. Let's get more mission-minded where we can, obviously in our hometown, and I think many of you have been doing it. You try to reach out to your own family and stuff, obviously, let's do that. But I think we can reach out a little further. And some might ask, well, what's the point of putting, like, these little gloves and hats and essentials? All we're doing is sending it to poor people and so they don't work. And the message is going to be about this. Right? This is going to be just so happens to be that I'm preaching on the same thing where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And you know what? People come seeking. Hey, we want, we want more. You got a sweet welf welfare program going on here. We don't want to work anymore. Give us more bread. Give us more bread. They, want, they like the idea of free food. Who doesn't like the idea of just government, take care of us. You know, a good welfare program. Hey, we'll vote liberal as long as we don't have to work anymore. We can just sit around and, you know, and government take care of our housing, our food. I mean, how many people don't think that way, right? How many preachers out there don't think that way? You know what? I'll preach a little bit and this and that. Church will just pay me. Or how many ministries, evangelists, I want a vacation to Haiti. Maybe the church will pay for it. We'll go to Haiti, dig a well, do something that they should be doing, but we're going to do it for them. That way, you, you go ahead, continue being lazy, worship rats, do whatever you do. Here's food, here's this, and never tell them about the gospel. Useless. Any ministry that we can't give them the gospel is useless. But there is good ministries out there, guys. Even as much corruption as you see, as much things you see, I don't know if this is a good one. I think it's all right. I think there might be better. You might have somewhere better to put your money. But what I want to encourage you guys, one way or another, let's get more mission-minded. Let's get, um, we can do something. I brought a bunch of gospel tracts. Uh, I had a tote, and I went to go find them this morning. A bunch of them, a lot of them are the same. My favorite ones are, I have a whole stack of those where it shows a picture of black and white of Jesus on there with all the sin written on there. It's a very detailed gospel track, very good one. I like that. I was like, the, the best thing is, <laughs> let's say you put some essentials in there. You put a gospel track in there. Imagine if that does reach somebody. What if that does reach some, some young mind out there who's still impressionable, and that is enough? For him to actually come to Christ, to start believing in 
the one true God and comes to Christ and gets saved and things start to change. All of a sudden his life starts to change and he does start to go to work. He does start providing for his own because he starts reading the Bible and he reads stuff like, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. You know, we got to look at the positive side. What can we do? I know there's lazy, drunk sinners out there and we say, well, they just want to be in this situation. You know, if we look at it that way, we, we, we lose compassion for people. We see a person on the street and we say, well, he put himself there. You don't know that. You don't know that. And besides, when you started sinning, whose fault was that? I could say the same. You put yourself there. Why would I go give you the gospel? You wanted to go do this kind of stuff. Jesus didn't think that way. He didn't think that way. But when people truly rejected him after he offered it, then he let him go. He did clean house. So that being said, if you're interested, there's 91 boxes back there. I think there's about, yeah, just over the 90 there. And grab whatever you want. How many of you want to fill? They have a list saying what you should put in there. I think it's what they kind of expect you to put in there. Let's put that way. And you can ask more questions. Maybe we'll put on the group a little bit more details. You have till the end of September. It needs to be back here. I would say let's do it a week before. Um, that way it gets to Grassy Lake. It's a ministry right in Grassy Lake. They used to do it in Ontario. Now they brought it. Somebody's doing it here also. They're having a hard time finding people to, I guess, join them, help them. Uh, there is volunteer work. You can also volunteer in Grassy Lake, sorting clothes, going through the boxes. They go through it, make sure there's nothing that shouldn't be in there. There should be no Disney stuff in there, no skull picture stuff. So um, there's supposed to only be King James stuff in there, King James Bibles, if you're going to put a Bible in there and stuff like that. So they're kind of picky in some of those areas. Some areas might seem a little religious that they are, but some things it actually makes sense why they do what they do. But there's a paper. I got a stack of papers. You can grab one of those papers or take a picture of it if you're running out of papers. Then we'll put that on the WhatsApp as well. What they kind of want to see in the box, the essentials, right? And then obviously a gospel track is essential. Put things like that. You can put a letter in there. No money. It'd go in the box. There's no, later they run, they have a fundraiser. Cost about 10 grand. They ship off the sea can. But you can, go backtracking a little bit. You can also, as a family, go to Grassy Lake and actually help sort clothes and stuff. Like you could actually get involved. There's volunteer work that is, needs to be done too. If anybody wants to physically just maybe not fill a box, but wants to go help sort the boxes, sort clothes, uh, there's fixing clothes, there's ladies that do sewing, put buttons. Okay, this shirt just needs a button and it's good to go. So there's a lot of work. So there is mission work out there. There is stuff that you can do. And um, I just figure I put that out there, pray about it, think about it. If you're already involved in mission some way, somehow, and you're too busy, that's fine. But I would say get involved <coughs> one way or another. Before we get into it, let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. <clears throat> thank you for everyone who's come out to hear your word. Lord, I just ask that you give me the gift of teaching and preaching this morning. Help it come across just simple and, and easy to be understood. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. John 6. This is a long chapter, but a lot of it is a story, right? We're going to go, I think, pretty quick, but I can't really foresee how it's going to go, but <clears throat> let's see where we make it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was hoping that wouldn't happen today. <coughs> Let me clear it first before we get started. In the meantime, find John 6, 1. All right. <coughs> After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were dis diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain... And there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now this is interesting. You see a big group of people, and they're coming to visit Jesus, right? They're coming to see him. So, I mean, it's just the social thing to do is, well, people are coming to visit me. He doesn't have a house, so, I mean, they're coming to him. It's kind of like... You would have people over. You kind of, you're going to, the socially right, correct thing to do would be give them food, offer them coffee, something, right? So here's Jesus. Well, this big group of people coming. Well, we should, we should feed them. But look what he does to his disciples. He says, and this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So he says to Philip, hey, we should feed them. Now, this is, this is interesting because this is just like, I'm sure 
I'm sure many of you have probably done this with your children. You'll probably test them. You'll prove them. You'll do things like, hey, all right, Lance, what do we do after we cut the chicken's head off? Well, we put it in hot water. We boil it for so and so long at perfect temperature. And then you, now what do we do after that? We put it in the plucker. You know what you're going to do, but you're saying, you tell me, what, are we, what should we do here? What are we going to do next? And what do you do? To see how much he knows. I do it in some of the scripture reading. Lance, what have you been reading? Teach me something. What have you been reading? What have you been learning? Damien, what, how about you? Where are you at with your Bible reading? <clears throat> and this you do. Maybe you've seen them read. Maybe you know already they're reading, but you're, you're testing them. You're proving them. Okay, Jesus doing the same thing. He's like you would do a child. He's saying, okay, what, w- what would we do here next? What do you think we should do? He knows what he's going to do. So this is a great deal of comfort. This is the teaching behind this. We don't have to understand everything that God's doing and have the whole game play, uh, plan laid out for us. What we need to do is learn to trust Christ and just go get involved in ministry some way or the other. Just like me, go and preach and think about it. There's a lot of times I just got to rely on the Lord. What's the Lord doing? What's he plan? If I try to figure all that out and plan what the next five years, what the Lord has, that's stressful. All I got to do is do what I can do now, where I can go, and I said, Lord has a plan. There's somebody watching over us, okay? And he already knows what he's going to do, who he's going to save, what's he, what he's going to do. You see, we don't actually need to put our business too much in that kind of stuff. We just got to be faithful and do what he says. But, so this is a test on Philip. Well, how are we going to feed these people? Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. This is like a year or over year's wages. Okay, because back then it was like a penny a day. So this is about a year if you take away weekends and holidays. He says, one of the, his disciples, <coughs> Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Now he mentions this. He must have just somehow come across. He said, well, there's a boy. I talked to him earlier. He, he seems to have a little bit of food, but I mean, that's not even worth getting started. It seems like it wasn't even worth mentioning. Why is he even mentioning it? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Now he's just counting the men. And he's organizing them like soldier groups type of thing. There was women and children there. But it's mentioning just the men. So you're talking about probably eight to 10,000 people there. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were sat down. And likewise, of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto the disciples, Gather up the fragments that remaineth, that nothing be lost. Now, in some of the other Gospels, it goes in greater detail. John skims over it very quick because it ain't the point of the message. It ain't the point of... You could say it's not the text of the message. The point today I'm going to make is not about feeding 5,000. We're going to skim over it just like John did. We're going to talk about it, but you're going to see why this story is mentioned and what follows is actually important. Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remaineth over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, which they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, saith, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. This is the point of the story. They're seeing this miracle. It's just a quick story, awesome miracle. You can go in great detail. You could preach a sermon on this by itself. To keep it in context, you can't do that. The context is, now they're saying, this is that prophet. Remember John the Baptist, a couple chapters earlier? They went to go ask him, are you that prophet? The Jews were well aware of it, that there was supposed to be a prophet like unto Moses that was supposed to be coming, and he would be the Messiah. So they're saying, this has got to be the Messiah. When they're saying, this is that prophet, they're talking about what's been prophesied in the Old Testament, the Messiah. So they're saying, this has got to be it. This has got to be the Messiah. So it sounds like somewhat belief here, but you're going to see how this turns around and how they reject him. But like this has got to be that prophet which is predicted to come. When Jesus therefore perceived 
that they would come and take him by forest to make him king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. You see, their way of thinking, even though they see Jesus, oh, he's a good man, oh, he's a prophet, oh, he's, he's what the Bible talked about. They still have a very twisted view of what he's doing. You know what so it is today? People may have a view of Jesus, but a very twisted view. They don't understand who God really is, who Jesus really is, and what his plan really is, was, or even is. They don't understand it. But you know what? If you go through Scripture carefully, you do, you do see who he is. You learn of him. You get a deeper knowledge of who Christ is. You understand him better, and you're more okay, way more okay with the things he does. These people are so unokay with what he does. That everything he does, like, well, why are you, do, like, no, we need you, oh, king. Like, come here. See, they were going to force him to be king. Look, it's been said this way. Look, if you could feed people, if you could feed people like this, even today, people would force you in a position like that. They'd want, if you could just make food appear, people would want you prime minister. That's what they want for a government. That's what they want. They want somebody who can feed them, take care of them, so I can be lazy and do nothing. Now, obviously, you know that's terrible for a person. When everything's laid out for you, taken care of, absolutely terrible. Destroys you as a human being. And Jesus didn't come for that, but that's what they're seeking. They're seeking to be fed. Feed us. They're seeking to be fed. This is awesome. This is awesome. Let, let's make this guy king. Jesus slips away because he knew already in their mind, we have to make him king. We want this guy in power. Get the Romans out of power. We need this guy. This is going to be great. We get to be lazy the way they were in the wilderness and just walk around every morning and just go get bread. Oh, just rain bread. This, this is great. That's what we want. I mean, we read about all the cool stories, Moses. If you're that prophet like unto Moses, this is what they're expecting. Oh, we're going to follow you around. You're just going to feed us. We're not going to work anymore. Totally misunderstanding what Jesus is even doing on earth. <clears throat> Moving on. So when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when <clears throat> even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about, rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, so this is about 25, 30, and I looked at that, that's about six miles. So it's quite a bit. They're trying to make it across and not really getting there because the winds and the storm is just really making the traveling hard on the sea. They see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But Jesus but he said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land where they went. As soon as they <laughs> let Jesus in, it's like they appeared at the, sh at the shore. So that in itself is a miracle. The day following, verse 22, <clears throat> when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one whereinto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, nigh unto that place where they did eat bread, after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus." And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? So they're not sure how he got there. That was a miracle in itself. He just appearing there and all, he's gone and appears on a different part. They had to ship across and trying to find him. So they're like, how'd you get here? We've seen you, you didn't leave with your disciples. So how'd you get here? Jesus answered. And then he starts telling him. He's telling him spiritual. Let me stop and say this. The book of John is a very spiritual book. Now, what I mean by that is, in other words, there's lots of spiritual things. In other words, what he's saying is not very literal. He's going to say things, and it's going to be very confusing because he means spiritual. He's going to talk about eating my flesh. He's not talking about actually eating your flesh. 
So I always talk about how the Bible, I believe the Bible, a lot of things to be very literal. But obviously, I do believe there's a lot of spiritual as well. When it comes to something like Revelations, I tell people, guys, this is more literal than you think. I think most churches take it too spiritual. They think everything, that means something else. When it talks about locusts and this and that, it means a helicopter looked like a locust, painted like it. That's what post-trip people a lot of times will do. They'll tell you all these stories that it could mean this and it could be war. And then when it talks about fire, it's actually, it's helicopters dropping bombs. It's not like talking about a horse and an animal and a locust. I'm thinking, yes, he's talking locust with a tail, biting people, stinging people. No, that's a helicopter. It looks like it has a tail and... So people get this idea, and I'm like, no, I don't think he's allergizing here. It's literal. In John, <clears throat> you'll see it's way more spiritual than the book of Revelation. Way more stuff that you have to spiritualize, you could say, than the book of Revelations. In other words, don't take it for face value what he's saying. See what he's actually trying to teach here. And because otherwise you come up with a Catholicism, and you're going to do what? Millions of people, over 200 million people are pretending to cannibalize the Lord Jesus Christ every week. And do you know how disgusting that is? Do you know how false and demonic that is? And that is not at all what Jesus meant. But I mean, you could say it this way. They're taking this part of Scripture more literal than we are. Way more literal. So you'll come up with a really demonic religion. <clears throat> and I'll say this also. you say, why would Jesus do that? He's about to mislead people. He knows they're going to misunderstand him. I think he knows that in the future, fast forward to today, he knows that there will be hundreds of millions of professing Christians lost doing a false religion, thinking they are partaking of the Lord Jesus Christ and that's salvation. When they do that, that's part of their salvation. They're trying to work their way by eating the Lord Jesus Christ and drinking his blood. They're thinking it's transubstantiation, they call it. It becomes, well, after the Lord priest prays over it, it becomes the body and the blood. It, the Lord, you don't think the Lord knew that? And you would say, why is he okay with that? Why would you say it in such a way that would form this big, false religion? Millions, hundred, over hundreds of millions, guys. There's over 200 million Catholic, Roman, so-called Christians out there. People think, oh, they're same. Oh, they're Christians just like us. <laughs> that is just as false as, I mean, worshiping it completely other God, worshiping an idol. It is a false perverted Jesus, not a Jesus at all, that they have. It is completely twisted. It ain't Christian at all. Why is Christ okay with that? That's what you got to understand here. Why would Jesus make this so complicated? Why didn't he just say it? Why didn't he explain himself? Let's listen to this. Look at this very carefully. He, and this, well, I said this ahead of time, I believe fully, and I think once you see me go through this, that you'll believe this also. He is trying to mislead them. Those that want to be misled, those that want to misunderstand Jesus, will have a very easy time misunderstanding him. He wants to watch out. Jesus is careful with his ministry to only gather sincere Christians, sincere God followers. So much so that his word, the scripture is written in that kind of, in that kind of way, that if you really want him, He's easy to get. He's easy to find. But if you're just going to lightly breeze over and you want to attach Christianity to your lustful addiction life, you will miss him. You'll die in hell. You'll miss the blood. You'll miss belief in Christ. You will, you will be somewhere misled with the scriptures. You'll go to a church somewhere and you'll be misled because you want to be misled. That, that's what's so interesting about this. That's not like you need to have this fear that you really want to seek God, learn about God, and find truth. That somehow it's impossible. The Bible is just such a big book. It's so impossible to learn anything in the Scripture. It's not written that way. But if you're just going to gloss over and take it like a devotional, kind of add Christianity to your life, you're going to gloss over it and you're going to miss it. And you'll end up like in Catholicism. You'll be like a, you know, a person that just kind of, hey, we, you add Christianity to your life, go to church every now and then, that's fine. And it might go to church all the time. That's part of just your lifestyle. It's, it's a good lifestyle, but you will die and go to hell. Here is a big group of people. They are believing he's that prophet. And look how Jesus misleads them. He, Jesus, why didn't you explain it? You could have won a bunch of disciples. He didn't seem too motivated. Look what he says. Verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles. You think, really? The, why not? 
Like, I mean, that was an awesome miracle. You think they're chasing Jesus? It's not because they saw the miracle. Think about it. I think for years I've thought it was because of miracles. They were following him. They love miracles. Kind of like a, a charismatic person. I, I thought that's kind of what it was. But look, he says it's not because you saw miracles. He did a bunch of miracles in Capernaum already. He did a bunch of miracles. They'd seen more than just this. But because you did eat the loaves and were filled. This wasn't some kind of spiritual feeling they got either. I used to kind of think that. He's talking because you physically got fed and you liked that. You liked the idea of not working and being physically fed. You've seen a miracle, and you've seen that this matches Bible prophecy that I'm that prophet. And you want the food that I have more than me. That was the problem. You want the blessings of Christianity, but you don't want me. And that's a real problem. Real problem. So many people want the fruit of Christianity today. They want good kids. They can swear, watch whatever, movies do whatever, but they don't want their kids walking around cussing. They don't want their kids. You know, I mean, these are precious. They're innocent. I mean, we want Christian kids. We send them to a Christian school. I mean, why do you think we do that? We don't want to train our kids, so that's why we send them off somewhere. We send them off somewhere, and then it, it says Christian on there, a bunch of Catholics and weed and pornography going around. No, no big deal because we can feel good about it. <clears throat> and I know that's offensive, but think about it. Think about it. Watch out. Watch out because just because it's Christian, school does not mean they'll lead them to Christ. They will give them some principles, some Mormons. I mean, you could go to Catholic church and they'll do the same for your kid. Catholic Sunday school would do the same. So, I mean, I would rather send my kids that's not a, a Christian school. I'm serious. Because that's how, don't paint it something that it's not. Don't paint it something that it's not. It's not Christian, okay, because you use a little bit of scripture or even you start off with a prayer. That's a good lifestyle. We all want to see our kids do that kind of stuff. But Christian is far bigger than just that. Next thing, okay, he says, verse 27, labor not for meat which perisheth. Okay, you guys are after being physically fed. That's all you care about, he's saying. You just care about being physically fed and you will want me to start some welfare program. He says, that's not what you should be after. That's not what you should, that's not what life is about. Just like today, life is not about how you can get ahead, how you can retire at 65, a millionaire, and, and just have this easy life where you never have to work again. You know, a lot of times people talk like that. What, at what point in life can I stop working? And we labor and labor for that. A mission idea comes up, nah. Poor kids, nah. Whatever. And if you give them besides, they're not going to go work then. It's like, we're bitter that we got to go to work every day. I hate my job. I hate that I got to work so hard, work so hard just to pay the bills and eat. I would like to go eat at the keg every day and not work. Give, offer me that, and we'll force that guy to be king that can give us that. Think about it. That's where their heart is at. And you know what? It's not that far off today with most people. It's not that far off. I mean, these are not more wicked people than today's day, okay? This is kind of shows the heart of man. It kind of shows what, what people want in their lustful flesh. Give us food. When can I retire and stop working and start golfing? And what Jesus is saying, labor not for the meat. If you guys are going to focus and you're working towards getting somewhere in life, I think you're missing life. He who tries to save his life will lose it. And he will lose his life. You know what Jesus meant by that? If you're willing to give up everything, not live the best here now, not, you don't care about keeping up with the Jones, that old saying. You really don't care about that anymore. That's you losing your life. I mean, everybody else is getting a life and big, big inheritance for the kids, right? I mean, we look at that as gaining life and wealth and, I mean, which is a blessing, a huge blessing to be able to have that. But we labor and labor. And when you do that, you will not be laboring in the other one. See, they don't go together, eh? You can't be focused on getting rich and focus on people dying going to hell at the same time. You can't. Think about it. The times when you are just focused on your getting rich, you are not focused on how to reach people. They don't go together. They don't go together. 
So Jesus, says, it's, it's very simple what he's saying here. And it's a hard saying because it hits all of us. It hits all of us. We are probably equally guilty even. I don't think anybody's necessarily more guilty. We live out here in Canada where we're blessed. And I mean, there's gold everywhere. And we eat all the time. We don't really need to worry about that. If not, the government sure will feed us. So, I mean, we're, we're set to go. Move on. He says, labor not for the meat which perish but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life. He says, you're coming for me for more food. You should be coming to me because of who I am. You should be coming after me to follow me, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? You know what they're saying? What kind of work they're talking about? Okay, then show us how we can make food out of thin air. They're still not getting. He's trying to point into him. And you know what they're doing? Okay, then why don't you show us how we can do the works of God? They're not happy with his answer that he's going to point back to himself. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he hath sent. People wonder, how can we do the work of God? How can we be spiritual? He says, you go to me. She said, come to Christ, come to Jesus. That's how <laughs> you are spiritual. That is the main work. You do what I do. Follow me, do what I do. I know we talked about that last time I preached a little bit. Jesus looked at God and said, I just do what I see the Father doing. Christian life is no different. We should come to Christ. That should be the basic. You come to Christ. Seek ye first him, first the kingdom. We've got all these things will be added. And then he's talking about physical things again when we, when we quote that verse. First you go to him. These other things will be taken care of already. Stop worrying about everything under the sun. Stop being so full of care. What you should care about is Jesus Christ. So much. So much. Don't get distracted. Don't lose focus. But these people are losing it. Well, show us how we can do the work. Verse 31. Our fathers, here's a spiritual guy stands up. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. He's saying, see, quotes Bible. They are misled, and they're using Scripture. Saying, we read about Moses and how Moses, he, he was that prophet, so they're thinking he's supposed to be that prophet. So we're expecting that you rain bread every morning, and we can stop working. We want to be filled again. It's morning time. I'm hungry. It was, it was since yesterday since you fed us. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. It wasn't Moses doing that. It was God doing that. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He said, now God sends the true bread. And it's me. And that you don't want. That you don't want. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Oh yeah, bread from heaven. Okay, now you're talking. Okay, he's talking about sending bread from heaven. This is great. They're missing it. Then he says, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Obviously, this is spiritual, right? You come to him for spiritual food, spiritual drink, you'll never need anything else. Nothing else, spiritually, okay? He will fill you spiritually. He gives you eternal life. He fills you. Your, your main need that you have is him. They're not seeing that. No, no, we, we, we want to worry about the steak we're going to eat today, okay? It's about, that, that's what we're talking. But yeah, eternal life, that's all good. Yeah, but come on, do something like Moses did. We want to see bread. If not, show us how we can do that. That's what we're interested in. He says, I am the bread. Now, for a long time, by reading this kind of quickly, I thought they were so offended that what he's about to say is, unless you eat my flesh and drink of my blood. Now, that was a hard saying. But what they're really offended at is what he just said, that he was pointing that I am come down from heaven. They didn't like that. Look at what he goes on to say, 36. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall, shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I am came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. 
And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again the last day. And this is the will of him that, that hath sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now this is, this is awesome. This is, I mean, this is just great teaching here. And they're missing it. They are completely missing it that he's saying, it's about believing on me. Now the Calvinists have taken verses like this to say, see, you can't come to Christ unless the Father draws you. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. It's kind of a big part of my message that I want to take some time. I'm not talking about taking just that much time, but I want to emphasize on it a little bit because I find this very, very interesting how this works. So you have people, think about it, in the Old Testament, they were taught of God. They were taught of God, all the stories of God and the scary stories of God and how God, I mean, you just don't mess around with God. As soon as they did, they complained, they murmured. I mean, the earth opened up, it swallowed some of them up, went right to hell, alive in hell. I mean, they read these stories. Okay, they see these stories. They see how serious God is, how precise he is in the tabernacle. John's been teaching all that kind of stuff, and he's going to continue a little bit. We've been learning all that kind of stuff. God is so systematic, so precise. It has, I mean, he is to be feared. Because, oh, that's not like the fear, like being scared of it. Oh, it is. I mean, then you really haven't read some of the scary things. I mean, if you're on God's bad side, that is scary. I mean, if you're in need of salvation... You should be terrified of dying today. It should be a terrifying thought, going to bed and not waking up. It should be terrifying. Absolutely terrifying, like the most terrifying thing ever. See, we belittle it, but it, it really is. Now I come to think of something. Jesus said, all those that were like, were my fathers, right? He says, they do come to me. See, the Calvinists want to take that and say, well, see, then you can only come if God first does a work in you. Now, they're partly right, but where they're misunderstanding it is now they're sitting here saying, well, I'm a sinner here in church, so let's see if the Lord's going to call me today. Let's see if the Holy Spirit's going to convict me today, and if it convicts me today, and then I'll come to an altar call and say a sinner's prayer, and then I'll willingly go get saved. But first, I got to get this conviction of the Holy Spirit. Very Calvinist view, actually. Because then you can't go and make a decision for Christ today until what? The Lord first draws you, right? I mean, and that's what the Scripture says, right? You see, it can be complicated. Well, if you can't come, and Jesus is confirming this, kind of saying, hey, look, I don't even expect you guys to believe me. He says, that's why he's actually building up a case here. I know you guys are rejecting me, and I know that, listen, guys, the only ones that are actually going to come to me already belong to the Father. They already know about God. They already love God. They love the God of the Old Testament. And I never heard anybody even really preach on this, but something big hit me. And I've been thinking, about, I've been talking to other people about this kind of stuff. I'm like, this is so interesting. I'm like, because I have always had this kind of in the back of mind, and I think many of you had it too. When it comes to training children, when it comes to training children, think about what, what is your job when it comes to training children? How can a verse in the Bible say, like, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it? Many of us believe that if not even all of us. But I've talked to people that say, no, because what you're saying, John, then, is, um, is that, that it's not even about, you know, kids when you have a choice. Like, if you just do your job training, they'll all just get saved automatically. They can't get saved. They got to make a choice still when they're old, older. So I have had people say, that verse in the Bible cannot be true because here's our dilemma. We clearly see people train their kids, and when they're old, they decide to go party and get drunk and live their life of sin and never get saved. And, I mean, you can't go blame the dad. You can't go blame the mom. You can't go blame the training. We don't want to take responsibility for that. You can't say that. That's a little harsh. Okay? And I got to think a little bit further. And now, this not even put my parents on the spot, but I got to mention it. I think of the one thing my parents really did right really right. Did many things right, but one thing really right, and many of us Mennonites can actually agree with this. They kind of taught us the fear of God. I was taught the fear of God. Growing up, God, church, all these things were serious things. Communion, I learned a lot of things were very serious. So one thing I knew from little on, God is scary. 
He throws people in hell for the littlest things. He's not a push around. Look at the stories of Moses. Look at Revelations. My mom often evenings taught us Revelations. And I actually now see how crucial that was for me to be motivated to actually get saved. How crucial that actually was. You know what we want to do today? We think that the Mennonite system was so bad that we've been taught and raised with because all we were taught is fear, 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 and never the love of God. But I remind you that that was not all bad. <laughs> yes, it was missing a key thing like, like Christ has, you know, wants to save you and no works attached. You can know where you're going. Why do you think it's so easy to actually go to a person that's open, has the fear of God, and you can actually, if he's open, you can go teach him, did you know you can know where you're going? Many of people have gotten saved because of that little debate. You go up to them and tell them, did you know? And I tell people, they say, how do I reach my parents? Go t- talk to them about how they can know. Because they don't know, and they really would like to know, and they know everything about the Old Testament. They're missing who Jesus really is. They've heard about Jesus dying on the cross and stuff, but they really are focused on their, what they're doing. But they have a correct understanding of the Old Testament, which is very healthy. Today, we're like, let's really give our kids uh, um, the, uh, none of the Old Testament scary stuff. Let's give them the grace, grace, just believe, just believe, you're fine, you're okay. And they grow up these second generation Christians. God's not scary. God doesn't care if I live like in adultery, if I view pornography. God doesn't care about this kind of stuff. He's really not that scary. And I said a sinner's prayer once. Yeah, I got saved. Yeah, when I was, you know, 12, whatever, I remember saying a sinner's prayer. I, you know, I should read my Bible more. I should love the Lord more and not chase getting rich so much. But you know, I, I'm saved. I, I got saved. I have a very unhealthy type of salvation, <laughs> if there's a, such a thing. They're, they don't understand the God of the Bible. Jesus is God in the flesh, okay? And he is going to judge, and he's going to throw people in hell. And people say, yeah, yeah, we know that, but you really haven't been instilled that fear. So, my main point this morning is this, actually, guys. Let's not screw up on our kids. Let's teach them the fear of the Lord. Teach them these Old Testament stories. They're actually kind of crucial. They are actually kind of crucial. You yourself need to understand the God of the Old Testament. These Jews, why they're not coming to Jesus, why they missed Christ, was because Jesus even said to them, you don't believe Moses, because Moses talked about me. And then I thought about it, I'm like, us Mennonites do believe what Moses said. We do believe that Christ was going to come. We actually have a more accurate and more believing the Old Testament than a typical Jew does today. Now, we have, a, we have a correct version of the Old Testament. A Jew does not. A Jew is not in any way closer to God. Let's put it this way. A Mennonite religion is far better than a Jewish religion. Far better. And I'm not comparing religion, but what I'm saying is many of us have thought maybe these Christian schools that we got sent to, and I know I harped on it a little bit, was all bad. So I had to start with that because what I see today in Christian schools are pretty terrible what goes on. But then I look at it, when my parents do send me to school, and I see their goal was to, to teach me all these Bible stories. I'm like, for that I am truly thankful. And I actually see now more than ever, just this last week, how valuable that actually is. How valuable that actually was. And that in itself was probably worth it. Because it was actually pretty easy when somebody came to me and told me about Christ. Yes, I rejected at first, but I did want to. If, I could, if you could convince me, I did want it. I already believed in Christ, and I already knew God was scary, and I was always been terrified of going to hell. And I've talked to many of you. You have the same story. You were terrified to go to hell. You knew. You went to the bed, and you said, where am I going to go? You know, the typical lost person today, let's say a lost, going to church, Christian that's just heard grace, 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 doesn't fear. He's lost, and he doesn't fear going to hell. So we think everybody's fearing. I mean, they don't even really believe in hell. I did. Many of you did. You were terrified as a kid to go to hell. Who terrifies their kids going to hell? <laughs> Christians. <laughs> Christians should. Tell them. Tell them who God is and how he's a, not a pushover. You do not mess around with God. You teach them. Then this brings me to 1 John. What does he say in 1 John? He says, I'll just quote it. I didn't write it down. Any of you know this. He's saying, I write unto you, you fathers, because you know you are strong and 
I'm paraphrasing, but the main one, he says, I write to you little children because you have known the Father. So John wrote to little children who know the Father. He didn't talk about knowing Jesus. He said to the youth, he says, how you've known Christ and you're strong. To the little children, he says, because you've known, you know the Father. You're, think about it. Your children need to know God the Father. They need to know who God of the Old Testament is. And the, the concepts of Jesus Christ and getting saved and how the, their need for it, they will actually by itself. You just teach them, say, Old Testament by itself. And they'll be like many of us. They'll know they need to get saved. They'll know they're on their way to hell. They'll know. Today you have a hard time convincing somebody they're on the way to hell. No, no, because Jesus this. They're living and partying and drugs and whatnot under the sun. And then you tell them that they need to get saved. They say, oh, no, I got saved. And no, no fear. And you know they're not saved. And you're like, I can't reach them. Your children are no different. Teach them grace, grace, grace. No fear of God. They're not going to really feel the need. They'll go along with it because it's a good lifestyle. But will they really be persuaded? Will they really, in their own mind, feel like they need Jesus Christ? Or will they just want bread? Will they just want these earthly things, these earthly blessings, go to church, good family, good marriage, all these good things? Many churches have that to offer. There's many a good Mormon marriages. Good Mormon kids out there. I mean, you can get that in a number of churches and different religions. Think about it. Think it through. When Jesus is teaching here, look how clear this is. These guys are not coming to him because he says, you don't even know Jehovah God. Because you don't really believe the Old Testament. You don't really believe the Scripture. If you do belong to God, then you will come to me. I will lose none. We always use this as a security of the believer verse. Now we can use it for that. But the context is not that. The context of this is actually these Old Testament saints that actually love God. And when Jesus comes, they are going to follow me. Because they were already God's people before I showed up. So when I show up, God's going to give them over to me. God's going to point them, draw them to me. And that's how it's going to be. And you guys aren't drawn, he says, because you don't know God. You see, don't get all caught up in Calvinism wondering why you're not being drawn. Because you don't know God of the Old Testament. You don't really feel like you need to. You're like, well, what can I get today? If you came to church, maybe some of you came, well, what can I get today? I like a topical message. I've had people give me pointers and stuff like that and how to preach and teach. Maybe if, you know, you give me something that's not so predictable. Like, think about it. I'm predictable. Two Sundays from now, I'll be in chapter 7, Lord willing. <laughs> and where will John be, right? <laughs> Verse 1 in Hebrews 6, right? <laughs> but no, you can kind of almost, oh, he'll be talking about this. And I wonder what he's going to say about that. And that's, that's fine. But I do get it, how a topical message is more thrilling entertaining for you. It really is. If a preacher puts the verses together, puts a bunch of cute verses and stuff like that and preaches, sometimes you get a good, good message. I'm not against that. But what I'm saying is there's a time for like really teaching. We do really focus on teaching. I want you to like learn something that 10 years from now you still know, you understand, and you actually do things differently in your life. You actually train your children a little bit differently because you learned something about scripture. That's, I feel my goal. Then I see fruit, and I say, wow, this preaching is so worth it. Jesus here, look what he says. Let's move on. You'll see this kind of stuff. He goes on to say how he's the bread of life. Now, I haven't looked down on my page for a long time, so I'm going to need to find it. Oh, they're murmuring here. Verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. The problem they're having is that you said you came down from heaven. That's what's offending them. And they said it is. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? You see their problem? You're saying you came down from heaven? You grew up in our community. Who do you think we are to fall for that? We, we watch you work with your dad in it's a carpentry, and we, we grew up with you. Like, you fixed our stuff and our houses and stuff, and now you're claiming you came down from heaven, like, and you want us to buy that. Remember what Jesus said, a prophet's not known in his own town? I mean, this is proof of it. They're saying, this is offensive. You, you're trying to trick us that you came down from heaven? We know who you are. We know your parents. Oh, don't, don't try to play that on us. 
43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me. See? So think about it. Your children can't come. Think about it. If this principle stands, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. See? You got to actually understand God and how Jesus is God. He said, look, I don't expect you guys to actually come to me. See, he's going to start cleaning house here. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Now, this is Isaiah 54, 13. How he's saying they shall all be taught of God, your children, it says. He says, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Do you believe me now on where I came up with this? He's not even talking about children. He's talking about them. But I see this as if that is true in them, and that was their problem in coming, it was not a proper teaching of getting them to God. That's why they're not coming to Christ. Then we can mess up their, our same generation. Our generation, we can mess it up. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Therefore, you can have a little bit more faith and train up your child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart. Teach him God. Teach him God and how Jesus is God. I'm not saying you stay away from New Testament. What I'm saying is teach him God. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. He's talking of himself. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread. Jesus is not the dead bread. You say, why would you say that? Well, Catholics think about it. He died and this and that. Now they're thinking they're eating his flesh. Transubstantiation, they think that now the bread becomes his dead body. <laughs> they're eating his body. That is a very twisted view. He never said to eat. He's, he's talking to these people about eating him now. Oh, clearly he's not talking about the way the, what the Catholics teach today. And you know what? Don't think we're that far off, guys. When I'm ripping on the Catholic, I'm just talking about how who started that whole thing. It's in the Lutherans. It's in the Mennonite. Okay, I've heard in the Mennonite churches, now take of this bread, which is the body of Christ. I didn't say that kind of stuff in German. Okay, they say, their words are, take this bread which is the body. They're not talking about a picture. And the Catholics took this so serious that when there was religions back then, you can research this kind of stuff. When there was religions back then who started thinking this, well, this is more of a, just a picture. They burnt them alive on a cross. They persecuted them severely. Anybody that would teach such false doctrine, they said, People like us, they would hate it. They would want to murder us for that. The fact that we're distorting their doctrine. They have writings about this kind of stuff. You can read up this kind of stuff that they took this very serious, that if people did not believe that this was actually Jesus, they were thinking you can't have of Christ's body. They took it so literal. And Jesus is obviously talking spiritual because he says he's talking about eating and drinking as in believing, synonymous with believe on me. Very clear, right? It's about believing, trusting Christ fully. They're missing that. And he's saying it in such a way that he's, these people that are not of the Father, they don't know God, that they will miss it. That's what's interesting. Why wouldn't he explain himself so that way more people would get saved? Because they're not sincere. He doesn't want false converts. You know, I don't think God's changed, guys. I think the Bible's written in such a way that people who want to be misled, it's, you're going to be misled. People who really don't like God of the Old Testament don't really like God. They're not going to find Christ. They're going to misunderstand Christ. They're going to misunderstand salvation. They're going to miss it. And you would say, really, that's God's plan? That's his plan, yeah. He doesn't want to save them. He said, why not? Unless you want to be saved, he doesn't want to save you. In other words, you're going to be tricked to being deceived to die and go to hell, and he can pour his wrath out on you. That's the plan for you if you don't want to be saved. But he does want, he said, after that, he said, but all that will come to me. I won't cast you out. If you want me, you can come to me. But if you don't want me, you just want what I have to offer other than eternal life? 
then go. I'm going to deceive you. Look what he goes on to say. He says, I am that bread. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness. He says, I am the living bread. Verse 51, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto him, Now, they had a misunderstanding, right? Clearly. These people are misunderstanding with that Jesus is talking about believing. They're thinking, he is talking about eating his flesh. How is he going to give us his flesh? So they obviously have a misunderstanding, right? Look what Jesus goes on to say. Just confuse them even more. He doesn't try to correct their thinking. He actually deceives them even more. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. They already have the concept that he's talking about actually eating him. And they're saying, how are you going to give us your flesh to eat? This is not an answer you give to somebody that's confused. Think about it. We could literally ask, Jesus, why are you just confusing them even more? They're not going to believe you. Can you imagine being his disciple there? You're believing, but you're like, Jesus, say it differently. They'll believe you then. D don't say it like that. Can you imagine the tips and stuff you'd want to give Jesus at the time? Don't say that. Don't do that. Jesus, here, do my sermon. They'll believe you then. He wasn't on a roll trying to get converts. He's like, oh, they're rejecting me. He's actually cleaning the house. He's actually trying to push them away. This is weird. Because people today think that Jesus is just everybody. Churches are set up that way. All are welcome. Everybody come. Just come on, come, come. We have this program for your kids. We got this. We got that. We just serve you bread all day. We have potlucks. We have this. People come because all oh, the youth, the potluck, the this, the that. And they come to be served, right? I mean, it's good for our kids. They don't come for Christ. They don't come for teaching of Christ. They come for programs and things. Think about it. And people set up different programs, smokes and lights and bands and different things to attract people. And what do they get? A bunch of false converts wondering why the church is not spiritual. We got to get more charismatic, maybe more, more fake miracles going on. Let's do something fake. Jesus didn't run that kind of ministry. And the people that run that kind of ministry are really running their own ministry. They're not running Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry is tell them if they don't want it, don't cast your pearls before the swine. Leave them. Just tell them. Give them an opportunity. Your job is done. If you can't, if they won't listen, they don't want to hear it, don't force it on them. Make it available, the gospel. Don't pressure people. Don't trick them into coming. Don't do that kind of stuff. Because think about it. Jesus didn't do that kind of stuff. He is cleaning out. People have a hard time seeing Jesus like this. They don't really understand how God works. He says, <laughs> He said, unless you eat, he said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. Look at this, verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. You got 250 million people out there thinking they're doing that every Sunday morning. You don't think Christ knew that that was going to happen? And, but he's not talking about that. These people are mightily deceived. He's not talking about actually his body turning into communion. And I will raise him up the last day. So people think that's part of salvation, communion. Why, do you, why in our old system, Mennonite system, why is communion such a sacred thing? Such a serious, think about it so serious when you talk to your kids about it. Because it comes from the Catholic. This is a huge thing of salvation. Be baptized and start having communion. So much so that some people have said if you miss so and so many communions, um, you know, you'll be lost. I mean, you can miss church. You won't go to hell for that, really. I mean, you could if you do too, too many. But you can miss a good amount of church. But do not miss communion. Why? Never really talked about, but deep in the background, the thought, and the, the thought process and the teaching is this. It's part of salvation. It's part of eating his body. If you don't partake of the Lord, you don't partake of communion, if we shun you out of the church and you're not even allowed back for communion, for sure you're condemned. For sure. Very Catholic. Very Catholic. Very false. Very misunderstood. And Jesus wanted to do that. He wanted to deceive them that way because he could have explained it. Now he does explain it a little bit. 
He says, verse 55, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He said, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? He says, Does this offend you? Now, so you think it's the whole eating. Now, I thought this for the longest time, but look what he goes on to say. This is how you do Bible study, okay? I'm going to teach you something on how to do Bible study. To not, for you not to be misled. All right, because you could right now, we could all say, what do you think offended him? Based on everything we talked about. You would want to say, because he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? You would want, I mean, that, that would kind of follow, right? Now, maybe that was part of it, but look what he goes on to say. He says, when, he says, when Jesus for knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, unto them, does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? What he's suggesting that they're offended at is the fact that he said, I came down from heaven. See, he said, I'm the bread that came from heaven. The point was, I'm the bread that reigned from heaven. <laughs> and what they had a problem with was, you grew up in our hometown, right? That was a problem. And how are you going to give us this flesh? So that was a little problem. The main problem, and I've missed this many times over, the main problem was that he said he came down from heaven. You know that because he said, oh, if that offends you, what about when the day comes and you see me ascend back up? If it's so offensive me coming down, imagine one day you shall see me go back up. What are you going to do then if, if you're offended at this little, this little say? He says, because you're going to see me go back up. Is that going to offend you too? You see how that's, the context. He says, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. I'll prove it to you I came from heaven. You'll see me go back up. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He's saying these are spiritual words. I'm not expecting you all to understand this, he's saying. They are spiritual words. See, John is a very spiritual book. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning that who they were that believed not and who should betray him. See, Jesus had disciples more than just the 12. We even find later in the upper room there was 120 up there. Okay, but he had his main 12 that kind of stuck with. One of them obviously was Judas, the devil, right? But he said there was even more. He knew all those that didn't believe. He said, look, I know many of you that don't believe. You're not going to receive this. These are spiritual words. You're not, it's not going to make sense to you because they're spiritual words. They're not, gonna, they're not supposed to make sense to you. You don't know God, so God can't reveal this to you. Remember Peter, he knew who Christ was. He, you're the Christ. He's like, flesh and blood has not revealed it. It's not like you're smart. Peter, it's not like you're some smart guy and you came up with this. It's like God's doing a work. God's showing you. He's revealing something. He's giving you wisdom right now to really see who I am. This is done through the Spirit. He says, look, there was this big group, and they were all disciples. As long as they were following Jesus and being taught under Christ, they're disciples. So think about it. Jesus would have all of a sudden disciples, and then he would lose disciples. Okay? So some people today think, like, maybe if you become a disciple of Christ, somehow that, that's synonymous with being born again. No. There's many people that become a disciple. They go get taught for a little while. They probably go to Bible college, go see if they're interested in the Christian faith. Maybe even interested in preaching and teaching. See how much money could be in it or something. And they'll do it for a little while, and they'll be a disciple, and they'll be discipled, and they'll walk away. People say, see, lost of salvation right there. Look, Christ knows all those who are fake. They're going to play the game a little while. Oh, you're that prophet. Oh, yeah, we believe in Jesus. Oh, wow, this is the Messiah. Great, give us more bread. And then Jesus scares them off. He's like, that's not what I'm here for. If that's all you want, go. Did they lose their salvation? Were they following Jesus for a little bit, and now they were sealed? A lot of people would think that. Totally misunderstanding. It's not much different. Yes, we're in a different dispensation, and once you get saved, you get sealed. But these people weren't, Jesus knew they weren't legit. They were going to leave. He knew Judas at some point was going to leave. He wasn't a real believer from the get-go. 
He was not a real believer. He knew right from the beginning. It says, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Verse 65, and he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of the Father. See, he's saying, Judas can't come to me. He can't come to me. I mean, the opportunity was there, but I don't expect him to come. I, knew who, I know who's going to betray me. I know a bunch of you guys are going to leave. You're just fake disciples. I already know you don't really love God. You don't know the God of the Old Testament. You've heard some stories, but you don't believe Moses. You don't believe the prophets. I don't actually expect you to believe me just because I have some miracles. You're not going to do it. And he's like, that's why I'm telling you. That's why I'm telling you. You cannot come to me except the Father draws you. Oh, the Calvinists would want to run with this, right? See? You can't do nothing. You just got to sit here and wait and hope God saves you. And so many too. Many people do. They just, they wait around. They want to be saved and they wait around. I mean, that's not how it works. If you want to get saved so bad, you can come to Christ. If you want Christ, you can go. From the, 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back. See, there was more than just the 12. Many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the 12, will you, ye also go away? Now this is the Christian response. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. He got it that what Jesus was saying was eternal life in itself. That the words, what you're saying, he's believing them. He's like, where am I going to go? Where am I going to go? That's why I have no faith in people walking away from their salvation. I just don't believe that too much. I tell people that, yes, it's possible, but I just don't have too much faith in that, all right? My faith just isn't that strong because when I see people like Peter, they're like, where are we going to go? Where am I? I, I think of myself, and many of you have talked to you, where are you going to go? What's better than Jesus Christ? You want to be a Jehovah's Witness? Like, really, have you ever considered that? <laughs> Somebody like that listening to this would be so offended. You've never even checked it out. I don't need to. I, like, where am I going to go? I have the words of eternal life right in front of me. I have stuff that makes sense and I can study. And these are spiritual words. They correct you. They, they do. They're alive. The words are alive. They convict you. They work in you. I've seen miracles, different little miracles and different things. But that's not what my faith is built on because I believed them before I've seen any of this. But later I've even had proof of things. I've seen God do work later. I'm like, wow. Like, you know, the one time I told you about this, uh, these kind of things. Some people would say they're coincidence. I don't believe it that way. I one time went to work, and I wanted to witness so bad. I was working at one of those oil, oil field places. I've mentioned stories before from that. Maybe this exact one. I'll just quickly tell you, but on my way to work, I remember praying, like, almost the whole way. I had, like, an hour drive, and I was praying. I was listening to messages a little bit. I, usually every morning. That morning, I was pretty much praying the whole way. God, give me an opportunity. And I was praying for different people, and, and not to sound spiritual. I do this rarely. <laughs> so I did this one time, and the first conversation got, we were on our way to work after a safety paperwork before you really had said anything else that morning I went down and one guy right away made a comment he was going to make fun of me somehow can you believe this guy used to drive around sports car and because I told him about my testimony how I used to be I'm like look I used to be no different than you guys care about my cars I spiked up my hair and I dyed them all white tipped I want to look like some 41 you know I'm, I thought it was all cool and I had car with neon lights system I told him like, I thought it was all cool doing that kind of stuff so I told the guy a story, and then he wanted to mention it. Can you believe it? Like, this guy actually did that in his past, whatever, like, because now they were shocked that, like, no, you've probably just been a goody-goody all your life. So he's trying to tell everybody, and all of a sudden everybody just stopped and started, no way, you know, started talking about it. My testimony, he started it. He wanted to bring up my story, what, like, how I came to Christ. He mentioned it, and everybody was tuned in and interested. And I knew God did it. So I'm saying, oh, that's just, I'm like, there was not even a doubt in my mind. I'm like, I remember you thinking, now? We're going to get in trouble. Like, I was literally thinking to myself, like, Lord, I'm supposed to do it now? But, like, I, I expect maybe lunchtime, somewhere there'd be an opportunity, like, just an opportunity somewhere in the day. And it caught me off guard. I remember you thinking for a little bit, like, thinking my story. And I was, ner I was nervous. I'm like, and where I was supposed to do it? And I started witnessing, and everybody was tuned. I got about 10 minutes there of just telling my story, how I came to Christ. I said, I have lived both lives. In other words, I have, I have lived a sinful life. I would never trade it for Christianity. Where would I go? Where would I go? And these people were interested. Everybody kind of quiet. Well, I went, back, went to work. And I'm, I've seen the Lord do things like that. 
I've seen little things like that. And different occasions yet too, but that's one in particular that I'm thinking of right now. And the Lord does things. When I think of these kind of things, I'm like, where would I go? What kind of dead religion do I want to try? No. So I'm convinced about, everybody feels that way. Once you've tasted the Lord, like Hebrews said, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? That's what Peter says. That's why I said this is the Christian response. Where are we going to go? And Peter stuck it through. Judas didn't say that. See, that, that would throw me off guard if Judas said that here. I'd believe, in law, I'd believe in law salvation. Peter said this. And I mean, we know who Peter was and what he did. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. We are sure. We know who Jesus is. Jesus answered them, I, Have not I chosen you twelve and one of you the devil? I mean, he's not letting off. Are you sure you don't want to go? He tests them again. You see why Jesus is running people off? Je- Peter just complimented him like crazy. You're the Christ. Where would we go? We've forsaken all, right? Remember he said in a different passage? Where would we go? He's like, oh, really? Haven't I chosen you 12 and want to use the devil? How do you know if you're a devil, Peter? Are you sure you don't want to go? You will be a devil? He tests him like one last time yet. See, he's not trying to keep disciples. He's testing him. Who really wants to stick with me, stick this thing through? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. He's trying to scare off Judas right here already. He gave his offer. Want to use the devil? Let's see if we get one more out of here. I know there's one more fake convert here. All the others left. Where's this one yet? Oh, he's going to stick it through a little longer. It's just a matter of time. He was going to run. He was going to leave. Just a matter of time. Now, what does that teach us, guys? That's the last verse. I know it's just about 1130. Think about it. The scripture's not that hard. You take these stories. You take these stories and say, well, you can put that in today. I know that was a different dispensation. This was still fully Old Testament. Nobody was sealed by the Holy Spirit here. But you see how you can, you, what you can learn out of this? Teach your children about God if they truly hear and learn from little on because they're very impressionable from little age. Very impressionable. You teach them from young, that is your most sensitive time to do, get to work. Don't be so caught up laboring for the meat when your children are falling on the wayside. Don't be so caught up in what this life has to offer and the fun things and the just indulging times that you can have and the hangout time. Guys, you will miss the boat. Your kids are going to jump ship, okay? That's what we call it. When they don't want nothing to do with your faith, they jump ship. They want nothing to do with it. It's because they, you did not do a good enough job teaching them the fear of God. You did not teach them the fear of the Lord. Many of us were raised, we were taught the fear of, the fear of God. And it helped. If you look back now, I see many of you even shaking your head. You're like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You were taught fear of God. And if you start to think it through, it's actually easier to come to Christ than somebody who's been messed up and Christianized, second generation Christians, we call them. If we mess up on our kids, they're going to have a whole lot harder time. We just grace, grace, grace teachers. That's what we become. Our kids are going to have a whole lot harder time than we did coming to Christ. They just won't take it that serious. We can learn all that. You know, even talking about this box ministry, you know why, why I actually got kind of passionate about it? Because it's children. Because it's not going to adults. I don't want to just feed an adult. Get to work. I feel like many of you. Get to work. Dig your own well. Get to work, you lazy bums. Like, do something yourself. Why does white man have to come everywhere and do Think about it. You know, because they look at it that way. And why I say it that way? Because that's exactly what some of these say, say in Haiti. They lay around and, oh, white man comes here and gives us everything we need. That's not what Christ asked us to do. We're supposed to go evangelize. It's not about just feeding people. It's not about just giving them a hat, a, a glove. This is going to Ukraine and it's going to a cold place. I get it. There's some essentials in there. But I'm like, if we can't put the gospel in there, I am not interested. But they say we can put a gospel track in there. You can put a letter. You can write them. But you can put your testimony in there, your address. They can write back. You might even see some fruit. Now you got my attention. What if you reach a, a kid? You can get from 10 to 16. You can get from 5 to like 10. The ages are on the paper. And you put a gospel track in there. You're like, eh, this might be what the kid needs. Learn about God. Learn about what sin is. I like my gospel track that shows what Christ had to die for. shows all the sin. Like, look how serious this is. Maybe give them an Old Testament story of who God is. Something. 
because they're impressionable. It might work. There's way more hope in trying to reach these the young ones than there's some of these adults who've been all messed up in church. So I, I'm all for children's ministry. And that's why we like to have them in here because that's how serious I take it. We don't want just, we don't want separate messages. We want them to learn the deep things just like us. We want them not to be, get any less than what we're getting. Amen? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for just who you are and the amazing things you've done and given us, most of all salvation that you died on the cross for us. And Lord, we believe, I think many of us here would agree, I hope all of us could say that we believe you are that true bread who's come down and, and Lord, you do satisfy us spiritually with, with hunger and thirst. As long as we come to you and search the scriptures, Lord, we can just you know, be filled again and again and it is satisfying. Help us not to be so distracted with work and business and just the many distractions that this world has to offer. Lord, help us to be more focused on loving one another and in fellowship and in, uh, just edifying one another. It seems like it's lacking so much in, in all Christians today that we're so self-centered. Lord, help us not to be like that. Lord, help us to have a testimony that genuinely, truly loves people and, and wants to see them grow and, and, and feel satisfied in their walk. Lord, that we don't have depressed Christians there should be no need for that kind of stuff. Lord, I just pray that if there's anyone who has lost their joy of salvation, they are saved, but they lost the joy. Lord, I, I ask that you return that joy, that they can be a joyful Christian, a fulfilled Christian life. We don't want their kids to see, uh, to see a wrong picture of you. Lord, help us to, to be a good testimony in this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.